There were two questions as a non-believer that I was asking of the New Testament. The first one was, can we hold the New Testament in our hand and say what we have is what was written down or has it been changed? I've already looked at that within, in a number of segments, but the second question was even more important to me. Was what was written down true? Did that, Jesus actually do that? Did he actually say that? I'd like to walk you eventually through four lines of reasoning. Now, it might take 10 or 12 segments to do it, but four or five lines of reasoning that brought me to the conclusion that I can hold the New Testament in my hand and have confidence that what it says is what happened and what Jesus said and what Jesus did. That first line of reasoning is this. The writers of the New Testament, the apostles, they wrote as eyewitnesses or they recorded eyewitness accounts. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and John in any court of law would be considered eyewitness accounts. Now, even though Mark wasn't, you say, what? No. Mark didn't observe much of what he wrote about in the Gospel of Mark. You say, why didn't he? For this reason. Mark was a scribe. He copied down all that who said? Peter. Peter was the eyewitness, and he was simply writing down what Peter had seen and heard personally. So that would be in an eyewitness account. Now, Luke was not. Luke uh, was assigned to examine everything carefully from the various eyewitness accounts. You see, there were many, many records of what Jesus has said and did. And the New Testament church was so committed to accuracy. They were so committed, they want to know exactly what Christ taught. Why? One, they were dying for it. Uh, they wanted to know that it was the truth if they were going to give their lives for it. So Luke was given the assignment. And he says in Luke 1, 1 to 3, that he examined everything carefully from the beginning from those who were eyewitnesses to check out each element to see that it's accurate. And then he said to write out the exact truth of what has been taught among us. So Matthew, Mark, and John were eyewitnesses. Luke recorded his gospel from those who were eyewitnesses. It's amazing when you look at so many of the scholars and their opinions about the accuracy of the transmission of the scriptures and their datings and all. Uh, a number of them were very contrary uh, to the conclusions that it's reliable, it's trustworthy, or early dating. But so many of them, when they would examine it, would change their opinion. For example, uh, Robinson, who was a lecturer at Trinity College in Cambridge, he accepted the consensus that the New Testament was written way later into the second century. And he, he thought that was a scholarly conclusion. But as little more than actually in his own words, as a theological joke, just to make a joke of it, he decided to investigate the arguments of the dating of all the books of the New Testament. And to his amazement and to his honesty, and I want to read this, he said, the results stunned me. Owing to scholar sloppy, scholarly sloppiness, the tyranny of unexamined assumption, and the almost willful blindness by previous authors. He went on to say, much of the past reasoning was untenable. And he concluded that the New Testament, now here's one of the greatest liberals saying it was written way in the second century. He concluded the New Testament is a work of the apostles themselves or of contemporaries who worked with them. And he concluded that every single book of the New Testament was written before 70 A.D. Folks, it is trustworthy. Mailar Burroughs of Yale University said, Another result of comparing New Testament Greek with the language of the papyri is an increase of confidence in the accurate transmission of the text of the New Testament itself. The text has been transmitted with remarkable fidelity. He went on to say, so there need be no doubt whatever regarding the teachings conveyed by them. And Dr. Howard Vaus um, made this statement. The case for the reliability of the New Testament is infinitely stronger than that for any other record of antiquity. 
Dr. Voss's conclusion is the same conclusion I came to after trying to refute it all. That if I could not trust the New Testament, then I'd have to throw out all literature of antiquity and become a total historic agnostic. We have looked at manuscripts, and I've spent a lot of my uh, time in my life just looking at the manuscripts, comparing them. And what I'd like to do is share with you what some of the, the scholars have to say about the New Testament. The first is William F. Albright, who was probably one of the greatest archaeologists ever. And this, this Jewish leader made this statement about the New Testament when he said, we can already say emphatically that there's no longer any solid basis for dating any book of the New Testament after about A.D. 80. Whoa! In my opinion, he said, every book of the New Testament was written by a baptized Jew between the 40s and the 80s of the first century, probably sometime between A.D. 50 and A.D. 75. That's the great Jewish archaeologist, William Foxwell Albright. And you realize in his lifetime, he wrote uh, books or major articles, over 800 scholarly books and major articles. And that was his opinion. Sir Frederick Kenyon, a man I've learned to respect over the years, he was the chief curator of manuscripts for the British Museum. Um, and this is his observation. I have to understand, he's one of the, he was one of the top experts in analyzing manuscripts. He said, it cannot be too strongly asserted that in substance the text of the Bible is certain. Especially is this the case with the New Testament. The number of manuscripts of the New Testament or early translations from it or quotations from it in the oldest writers of the church is so large that it is practically certain that the true reading of every doubtful passage is preserved in some one or other of these documents. Dr. F.F. F. Bruce, until he passed away several years ago, was a number one um, expert in the world at Manchester University. And he was, I would say he was the greatest authority on manuscripts. He made this observation. The evidence for our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical authors, the authenticity of which no one would dream of questioning. And he went on to say, and if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. That is a lot from the number one authority in the world on manuscripts. And then again, Sir Frederick Kenyon, the curator of the British Museum in London, England, uh, he made this statement. He said the interval then between the dates of the original composition of the writing of the New Testament and the earliest evidence becomes so small as to be in fact negligible. And the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures had come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. And then he made this amazing statement. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books in the New Testament be regarded as finally established. He said, well, Josh, okay, I know, I know there's a lot of copies, everything else, but I think maybe those copies have been changed and all. I wish there was something apart from that. Well, you know there is. Totally apart from the New Testament, take every Bible in the world and burn it. Take every manuscript and burn it. Take every Old Testament, every New Testament, and destroy it. And within 100 to 150 years of Christ, closer than any other book in history, I can recreate all of the entire New Testament except for 11 verses. Say, come on, you can't do it. Yeah, totally apart from the Bible, manuscripts, or anything, I can reconstruct the New Testament totally apart from any manuscripts. Say, that's impossible. No, it's not. Here's why. The early church fathers, 
like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Origen, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria. They would write letters to the churches to encourage the churches. And in their letters, they would copy the scriptures. And then when they would travel to the churches, whatever, they would give sermons, they would speak. And just like today, back then, in their notes, they would copy the scriptures. And to be able to record of just the New Testament in the early church fathers, over 36,289 quotations of just the New Testament. And Sir David uh, Dalrymple, he examined very carefully for years all the early church fathers' writings, letters, and sermons. And he found the entire New Testament quoted except for 11 verses. I can take his work from the early church fathers and recreate the entire New Testament except for 11 verses. Now, it might not be the most accurate account uh, because they weren't trained in copying. But even then, I don't believe there's any other book in history that you can do that with. I can hold the scriptures in my hand and say what I have is what was written down. But was what was written down true? After the resurrection, after their Savior, the Messiah, was killed, something happened that turned their lives upside down and never once denied it. And that fact was that on the third day he was raised from the dead and he appeared to them with all kinds of convincing evidence and proofs, they said, that he'd been raised from the dead for 40 days. When I was going into law school, my hero was Dr. Simone Greenleaf. He was the famous royal professor of law for years at Harvard University. One of the great legal minds of our country. He was a man that could break down a testimony in a court of law. In fact, the joke used to be, he was so persuasive he could take someone who was telling the truth and make them think they're telling a lie. And he was a non-believer. And some of the students in his classes one time challenged him to take his, uh, he did three volumes in the laws of legal evidence and how to evaluate testimony. They challenged him to take that and apply the same principles to the resurrection. After much persuasion from the students, he did that. And in the process, it looks like he became a believer. And he went on to write a book called The Examination of the Testimony of the Four Evangelists. And Dr. Simone Greenleaf said this, the annals of military warfare afford scarcely an example of their heroic, constancy, patient, and unflinching courage. Meaning the apostles, they had every possible motive to review carefully the ground of their faith and the evidence of the great facts and truths they asserted. And yet they became martyrs. That night in the university, I was all alone. It's when I knew I was going to become a Christian. I knew I was going to come to the point of trusting Christ as Savior and Lord. I didn't write then, but I knew I was going to. It's that night I was alone. I saw and spent so much time studying the scriptures and the resurrection. Even though I was all alone, right out loud, I said, He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, then what happened to the lives of the apostles that turned their lives upside down? Could a lie have accomplished that? Then if it did, then a lie accomplished more courage, more boldness, and more truth than the truth ever has. I have read all the great thinkers. I have read all the thinkers that think they're great. And I have concluded not one of them has ever come close to satisfying my intellectual curiosity if Christ wasn't raised in the dead, then what impacted the lives of the apostles and became the very formation, the basis for the formation of the church? He is risen. I can hold the New Testament in my hand and say what I have is what was written down has not been changed and what was written down was true. Jesus said this and Jesus did this. What happened to the lives of the apostles? 
I could see Peter talking to John. And this could be a realistic conversation. John, John, what do we do? We're wrong. He's not the Messiah. John, he's dead. John, we've left everything. We've left our business. We left our families to follow him, the king that was going to rule the world. John, he's dead. He's not the Messiah. How could we have been so mistaken? And when it says that the apostles went back to their homes and hid themselves out of fear, I believe that, yes, they did have fear. Look, they'd faced off against Rome and Israel. They, they, of course, they had the fear of being killed. But at the same time, I believe when they went and hid themselves in their homes after the crucifixion, they were depressed, disillusioned. Now, come on, put yourself in their shoes, their sandals. Think what they must have been going through. Here they'd been following the Messiah in the face of all opposition. They'd left their businesses, families, everything, because he could not die. He was the reigning political Messiah that would rule the world from Israel. And he was killed. He was dead. I mean, all their aspirations, everything was just destroyed. And when they went to their houses, they were depressed. But something happened. And I remember as a non-believer in the university, as a student, I struggled with this. Something happened, not over a period of months and years, but of days and weeks. Their lives were turned upside down. And they went out and turned the world upside down. And they were tortured and beaten and persecuted and killed for one thing, an empty tomb. And in their own words, the appearance of Jesus of Nazareth for 40 days with many convincing proofs that he was raised from the dead. And they never once denied it under the worst torture. That goes against everything I've ever known of people's character in history. What changed their lives? It was because Christ was raised from the dead and appeared to them. Dr. Kenneth Scott Latterette, who was for years a professor of Oriental history at Yale University, said from discouraged and disillusioned men and women they sadly looked back upon the days when they had hoped that Jesus was he who should redeem Israel. And they were made over into a company of enthusiastic witnesses. What happened that did that? That so changed them from cowards to men of courage, from martyrs to missionaries. Only thing could have been the resurrection. Jesus was the most unlike candidate to be the Messiah of his time because they looked for a reigning political Messiah. But Jesus said, I came to suffer. I came to die. Lord, you can't. You're the Messiah. The Messiah can't die. You're the son of David. He said, I came to die, but I'll be raised again the third day. And they couldn't understand him. Let me give you a little of the background from Jewish sources about this attitude about the Messiah. Dr. Jacob Gartenhaus, a Jewish professor, put it this way. The Jews awaited the Messiah as the one who would deliver them from the Roman oppression. The Messianic hope was basically for a national liberation for a redeemer of a country that was being oppressed. This is what they were looking for in the Messiah. The Jewish Encyclopedia puts it this way. The Jews yearned for the promised deliverer of the house of David, who would free them from the yoke of the hated foreign usurpers, who would put an end to the impious Roman rule and would establish his own reign of peace and justice in its place. They were looking for a reigning political Messiah. Dr. Joseph Klossner said, The Messiah became more and more a preeminent political ruler but also a man of preeminent moral qualities. Dr. Finley Scott, Professor Scott said this, To the people at large, the Messiah remained what he had been to Isaiah and his contemporaries, the son of David, who would bring victory and prosperity to the Jewish nation. In the light of the gospel references, it can be hardly doubted that the popular conception of the Messiah was mainly national and political. But Jesus said, I came to die. I came to die for you. I'm going to be crucified and buried. And they said, no, no, you can't be. But men and women, what happened? You see, at the crucifixion, even then, I think when they put Christ on the cross, 
they believed he was going to, in a kind of a sensational way, come down off that cross and set up his kingdom. Until what happened? Yeah. They thrust the spear into his side. And the eyewitness account said blood and water came out separated. And even then they knew that was a sign of death. He was dead. Yes, a lot of people have died for a great cause. But their great cause died on the cross. What did they die for? I'm going to deal with that in the next segment. So the Jews thought there were two messiahs coming once each. Jesus said, no, there's one messiah coming twice. And this is how they arrived at that. And how Jesus was a most unlike candidate to be the messiah of his time. For example, and I document all this, going back before Christ, Palestine was invaded. And they were slaughtering the Jews. I mean, some of the historical accounts say the bodies of Jews were stacked up 20 feet tall. That's two stories high all over Israel. They were being slaughtered. And the Jewish soldiers and the lay people were walking away from the Jewish leaders. Why? Now think, they were telling them, hang in there, sacrifice, give your lives. Why? Because the Messiah is coming and he's going to die for you. They go, wow. That's quite exciting. Does he have a grandfather clause? No, I'm serious. Uh, and so they thought, this is not worth dying for, a dying Messiah. So they started to walk away. So if there's any two people in history that learn how to survive through, through uh, adjustment, it's the Armenians and the Jews, and they adjusted. And I document this. This is what they started to teach, that the first Messiah, the suffering Messiah, was who? Not the son of Joseph but Israel. You say, what? Yeah. Many Jewish leaders would teach that today. Uh, that, that the Jews, Israel is the suffering Messiah. They'll say, look at our history. Look at all the suffering we've been through. This is why one Jewish leader a number of years ago on television blamed the Holocaust, the killing of six million Jewish people on the Gentiles because he said, God took the sins of you Gentiles and placed them upon the Jews and sacrifice six million for your forgiveness. So they taught that the Jews themselves were the first Messiah. Now the second Messiah, who would be the son of David, would now be the one coming, would be the reigning political Messiah, who would drive, the, drive out of all Jerusalem, Israel, the hated usurpers, and rule the world from Jerusalem. And they did this to give hope to the soldiers to be able to fight on. Well, when it came to the time of Christ, do you see why they couldn't understand him? Jesus said, I came to die. I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be beaten and persecuted, killed and buried. No, no, you can't go there. They will kill you. Jesus doesn't understand. I'm going to be killed and buried and raised from the dead. But whenever Christ mentioned the resurrection, they couldn't understand him. Why? Because to the Jew, the Messiah could not die. He was a reigning Messiah, the son of David. And, and remember it said, is it now? You know, they were getting impatient with Jesus. Say, look, get your act together. I'm being reverent. Get your act together. Is it now that you're going to set up your kingdom? Were they thinking of a suffering Messiah? No, a reigning political Messiah. Lord, can we reign in your right hand? They didn't ask if they could suffer. See, their whole concept was a reigning political Messiah. Jesus said, I came to die. Many skeptics will say, Josh, a lot of people have died for a great cause, and that is true. But the great cause of the apostles died on the cross. Let me give you a little historical context to greater appreciate that statement. Did you ever read the Gospels and ever wonder why the disciples could not understand Jesus? Have you? Uh, I mean, he almost constantly insulted them in, in, in many ways. Haven't you read, you know, do you not know? Jesus would say, is it not written? Have you not read? Does it not say? Well, they didn't know. And it was like if I walked up to you and say, look, don't you know? Haven't you read? You'd feel about that big. Well, I kept thinking as a non-believer, the apostles must have been a bunch of numbskulls or, or idiots uh, because they could not understand what Christ said. Now, why is that as true? The reason is this that Jesus and what he didn't said, what he did 
and said over a period of time of the apostles and how he acted was contrary to their image of who the Messiah would be. Did you ever think about that? That's why they couldn't understand him, because he didn't fit the mold overall of what all the Jews believed the Messiah would be like. You see, what do you mean by that? Well, let me give you a little historical context, and it's going to take me several segments to do it. You go back years before Christ, or even at the time of Christ, the Jews taught, now, now get this, that there were two messiahs coming once each. You said, what? Yeah, there are two messiahs coming once each. Jesus said, no, there's one messiah coming twice. Oh, that's an interesting twist of history. The Jews taught the first messiah would be the son of Joseph. The Messiah who would suffer for the sins of the world and be killed. The second Messiah was the son of David, who would be the reigning political Messiah, would throw the hated usurpers out of Israel and Jerusalem and rule the world from Jerusalem. Jesus said, no, I am coming first to suffer and I'm coming back to reign. You say, how'd they come to that conclusion? Very easy. Read the Old Testament. One book will talk about a reigning political messiah, the next a suffering messiah. One verse will talk about a suffering messiah, five verses later a political reigning messiah. So the Jews said, there must be two messiahs coming once each. Jesus said, no, there's one messiah coming twice. Over a number of segments, I talked about four lines of reasoning that gave me the confidence that I could trust the New Testament, that this is what Jesus said and what he did. One, they wrote as eyewitnesses. Second, they appealed to the knowledge of knowledgeable, hostile eyewitnesses of the truth they presented. Third, that the apostles gave their lies for it. And people say, well, a lot of people have died for a lie, yes. But they always thought it was the truth. If the resurrection was a lie, they had to know it. Therefore, they not only died for a lie, but they knew it was a lie. Now, the fourth line of reasoning is based upon the same thing. Here were 12 men. 11 to 12 apostles. John died in exile. Judas was replaced. They died for one thing. The appearances of Christ, in their own words, in Acts 1, 1 to 3, Christ appeared to them after he'd been killed and buried. That they said with many convincing proofs, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Not four days or 40 hours, 40 days. Now, was that true? Well, they went out, and they were not only tortured for their belief in the resurrection, 11 of the 12 were killed. You say, well, Josh, a lot of people have died for a great cause. You know, that's right. A lot of people have died for a great cause. In fact, a lot of people have died for a lousy cause. But here is what I struggle with as a non-believer. Yes, a lot of people have died for a great cause. But the great cause of the apostles died on the cross. What they die for? Most people don't reason beyond that. Well, in the next few segments, I want to take you beyond that of what kind of cause did they die for? The 12 apostles, 11 of the 12 died martyrs' deaths for one thing. In a number of segments, I've dealt with that. I would like to relate to you what a friend of mine, his name is Gary Habermas. Dr. Habermas is probably the number one expert in the world, or one of the top two uh, on the resurrection. He's probably written more on it and more research than anyone else. And I want to read through some of his analysis of the apostles being willing to die for a lie. Dr. Habermas says, the skeptic might object Followers of other religions and causes have willingly suffered and died for their beliefs. So in other words, saying, what's the big deal about the apostles dying for their beliefs? He goes on to say, even atheists have willingly died for the cause of communism. This does not mean that their beliefs were true or worthy. And then he goes on to say, liars make poor martyrs. And then he said this, extreme acts do not validate the truth of their beliefs. But willingness to die indicates that they regard their beliefs as true. This is how I put that. 
and it's a phrase I developed, is that the extremity of the act speaks nothing of the truthfulness of the event. You say, what do you mean? Well, this, just because someone dies for something, because someone is martyred for something, does not mean it's true. Because they gave their life for something does not mean it's true. But it does mean this, that they believed that it was true. Just because you die for something doesn't mean it's true. But it does mean that you believe that it's true. But here's the catch with the apostles. If the resurrection was false, then they had to know it. And therefore, you'd have to say they not only died for a lie, but they knew it was a lie. That would go against everything I've ever known of human nature in history. And Dr. Habermas went on to say, contemporary martyrs die for what they believe to be true. The disciples of Jesus died for what they knew to be either true or false. After Jesus' death, the lives of the apostles were transformed to the point that they endured persecution and even martyrdom. Such strength of convictions indicates they were not just claiming that Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to them in order to receive some personal benefit, but they really believed it. Compare this courage to their character at Jesus' arrest and execution. They denied and abandoned him. They hid in fear. Afterwards, they willingly endangered themselves by publicly proclaiming the risen Christ. If I can't trust them on what Jesus said and did, they signed their testimony in blood, I'd have to be a total historic agnostic.